Um, one thing for sure is that it affects children in a multiple level, cognitive level, uh, emotional level, social emotional development way. And also um, the family dynamics, uh, friendship dynamic, and so on. So it's a huge issue among the children. Welcome to Digital Mindfulness, the very first show of 2018. I'm your host, Lawrence Ampofo, and today we're talking with the CEO and founder of the Digital Quotient Institute, Dr. Yuhan Park. The DQ Institute is conducting groundbreaking educational work in preparing children to successfully navigate the digital world. You should listen to this show if you want to understand what digital intelligence is, how best to educate people and children around the world, and also how important it is for children, especially to have a high DQ level. But first of all, welcome to Digital Mindfulness. This is the weekly show that brings you the brightest minds in the world to help you understand and discover new tools and techniques and ideas to help you spend your time well in your digitized life. In our show, we cover everything from design to new technologies to new research and also events that are working to put humans at the center of our increasingly digitized world. Okay, on with the show with Dr. Park. It's great. So thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Park on Digital Mindfulness. Um, It's a real pleasure to have you on and I'm really thrilled that we could finally get the chance to talk. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm wondering if you can tell the audience a little bit about yourself and particularly how you came to focus your work on digital citizenship. Sure. Um, I describe myself always like 100, 100%, 100% researcher as well as 100% activist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my background is a data scientist. I did a PhD from biostatistics from Harvard and I did a one year postdoc in a Harvard uh, Medical School in Public Health working on the, um, at the time, um, bioinformatics, computational biology, developing a DNA chip algorithm. And then I moved to a Boston Consulting Group uh, as a consultant and media specialist. And then I became a mom. Um, so I, that was a time that 2007 and 2008, um, traditional media collapsed because of uh, um, the digital media uh, event. The internet actually um, enabled um, whole landscape of media industry to be completely changed. Hmm. So in, in the midst, um, uh, I have a baby, I had a baby for a child. <laughs> uh, I, my hormone go really high. Hmm. Um, and then I saw that the side effect of this industrial changes affects children uh, tremendously. Hmm. So um, I'm South Korean and at the time uh, in Korea, um, which is actually uh, one of the, uh, the best IT infrastructure and the fastest internet in the world um, had a serious issue in a game addictions. So at the time, almost like 20%, one out of five kids can be diagnosed as a, a pathological um, use of um, game, um, which is, we call it game addiction. And they're exposed to a lot of violent content as well as uh, um, obscene materials. Um, and because of industry actually moved so fast, there was a lack of awareness of issue. At the mm. same time, um, there was not much of policy uh, regulation toward to protecting children, especially in Asian country. So as a mom, as a um, as experts in uh, digital media, um, I was upset. <laughs> and... <laughs> And there was a time I started to think about, um, yeah, we need to think about it, not just as an individual issue, but as a societal issue. So I started out a social movement called Involution Zero in Korea. Involution means information pollution. So all this issue related game addiction, um, violent content, hate speech, cyberbullying, uh, privacy issue are unintended 
negative outcome of uh, ITC and digital um, technology. So we, um, we as a, actually my team, initial founding team, believe that this is a societal issue that we have to tackle together rather than we tell the individual kid, you have a problem, uh, you're bad kids using the game and so on. So that was a starting point that I got interested into um, digital citizenship as a vehicle to actually empower children, not just as a victim, but also train them to move from the risk to the opportunities. Um, yep. Mm, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And I think it's something that um, particularly um, us over here in Europe and, um, and maybe North America as well, we don't know a lot about um, in terms of this whole idea of, you were saying pathological um, game addiction. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and just um, the extent to which it's a problem? Um, so there are two schools of thought related to so-called game addiction. Um, one big school says it's, it's really like an addiction that affects um, the individual life in a very detrimental way. Mm. Um, and the other party is, is it cannot be called addiction rather than it can be called excessive use of technology and game. Mm. Um, as a researcher, I can say a tons of things, but as an activist, it doesn't matter what the words uh, exactly. can be defined. Um, one thing for sure is that it affects children in a multiple level, cognitive level, uh, emotional level, social emotional development way. And also um, the family dynamics, uh, friendship dynamic, and so on. So it's a huge issue among the children, um, especially in Asia, um, in Korea, Singapore, um, Thailand, uh, Thai, and Taipei, uh, in Taiwan, in U.S. If you look at the research data, um, usually we call so-called ICT in advanced country, these countries have a very similar statistic. One out of 10 kids uh, who play the game, which is almost every kid <laughs> play the game, uh, can be diagnosed as a pathological use of uh, um, technology. Gosh. The game addiction is it's, it's huge. Yeah. Wow. So then I think, I mean, this is a really nice point to then talk about digital intelligence. So I wonder if you can tell us what digital intelligence is and why it's so important. Um. So we defined the digital intelligence concept um, in two years ago. Uh, what we found um, as a researcher, um, I was very interested in to understand what are the digital skills that empower children to become independent thinker and critical thinker uh, to uh, avoid the risk, at the same time, maximize the potential use of technology. So uh, with that framework, we um, we did it, we look we work closely with the uh, primary school teachers, especially you know we target the primary school kids to understand what are the aspects of digital citizenship and beyond. Um, so we uh, define the A category. So on these days, uh, there's a lot of terminology: citizenship, literacy, <laughs> and so on. Uh, but in, there is no one. Uh, it's common standard or um, definition on that regard, but why, how we actually define the digital intelligence is it's not just about citizenship. It is not just about the uh, literacy. We want to define the collective ability that an uh, individual can cope with the demands and challenges uh, in digital life. So we identify eight areas from digital identity. So identity as a digital citizen, identity as a creator, identity as an entrepreneur. So the identity is a, um, a very important issue in digital space. And second is about digital use. So how they use uh, digital technology, uh, how we want children to uh, have a self-control to balance online and offline reality. Uh, that is the second part that we talked about. The third aspect is our digital safety. Uh, we want children to avoid uh, cyber risk um, in every every layer. The fourth is about the security, mm -hmm. cyber security. Uh, 
So basically, the safety and security, we made it to distinction because safety involved the behavioral uh, issue, but security is more on the data and their device, um, the security that we are talking about. And uh, um, another aspect is uh, digital emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is hugely important. And it works differently um, than the physical space because we don't talk to each other uh, in a face-to-face. So we, it requires a different dimension and digital communications, of course, you know, how we interact, how we collaborate, how we talk to each other. And digital literacy. Digital literacy is really a practical way of uh, understanding information, aggregate information, discerning information. Um, at the same time, how we can um, enable children's um, individual career more. The lastly, less important, um, not the list, is a digital rights, uh, which is a huge aspect that the um, individual needs to learn. Um, uh, it's starting from the privacy and freedom of rights um, and civic engagement and so on. So we look at the eight different um, parts of uh, intelligence, what we call, and we made it also into the three levels. The first level is a digital citizenship. So it's like a matrix system, uh, digital citizenship, and move on to the creativity. And then last part is entrepreneurship. So they need to have the basic life skills and then they know how to create and participate. And then based on that skills, how they can create the values as a, uh, not necessarily business entrepreneurship, as, as an initiative uh, mm. makers. Yep. I think that's really, I mean, of course, this is completely fascinating. And I'm wondering, I mean, my first question to this is how do we even teach the I mean these sounds like core skills that um not just children but everyone needs in a digital environment which or digitized environment so how do we even begin to start teaching um people all of these critical skills is it something that has to be done in school first or are there other ways to kind of give people these skills um, that's a very good question. That's what we are grappling as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, we started out a global movement called DQ Every Child. So we target the age group of eight to twelve uh, to empower them with the digital citizenship skill first. So uh, we developed the online uh, program. Uh, they can holistically touch upon these eight topics. And um, we're providing this program like a vaccine. And in many countries, this is age group, they start to own their, their, their own mobile devices. So our strategy is um, before you get virus, you get vaccinated. <laughs> Just yeah. like before you start driving, you get driver license. So what we say is that before you actively use the digital media and technology, you get the basic life skills on the DQ. So this is our strategy, and uh, this is a research base um, the program that we provide the, um, the worldwide. Uh, so it has been uh, validated through the research in 2016 and uh, 16. And we started out the global movement this year in March. And uh, we did in eight months, uh, we, we have about the schools from 30 countries participate in this program. And it has become quite successful. So we're working with a lot of uh, our nations to support uh, their um, uh, primary schools education to provide the source or uh, the tools uh, to use. Mm. that's amazing it's amazing that i mean you said that these are schools from all over the world um that school like you know kind of education leaders recognize that it's um it's critical to give children these skills but it's also really fascinating to me that you say the first step in digital intelligence is becoming a digital citizen first Mm -hmm. um why why is that why is that step, would you say, why is that more important than, say, um, digital empathy or critical thinking? Uh, 
actually, digital citizenship is also has the eight components. So okay. um, that includes the empathy and critical thinking. So first level of a D2, when we say digital citizenship, we, um, we, we within digital citizenship, we have eight topics again. So we picked the what are the uh, the basic things that we want to teach children age group eight to twelve mm. is that we want them to have um, identity again as a digital citizen. So we want them to understand when they go online, they are a digital citizen. Mm. And then the second part of digital use, we talk about screen time management. So because screen time is the first actually gateway for them to go to the uh, the digital world. So we tell them about what it means to be screen time and how to self-control this screen time and so on. And third, uh, within the cyber safety, we talk about especially cyber bullying, which is um, going to be a very bad to worse these days. <laughs> so we teach them about the, what it means to be cyber bullying, how you can avoid and uh, prevent and mitigate the risk, respond when they uh, encounter a situation. And the security wise, we talk about the basic stuff about, um, first about the risk, um, the spam, scam, phishing, and also we teach them about how to, uh, how to set the strong password and so on. Um, and emo among the emotional intelligence, we talk about empathy because that is the first thing that we actually teach children to be most important, a basis of um, all this. And literacy wise, we talk about critical thinking, literally critical thinking in a way that, you know, when children first go into the digital world, uh, for instance, when they play the Minecraft, they um, receive not just about the game as a content, they also meet with the new people and they receive information. So we need to give them a critical thinking, what to avoid, what to choose. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, um, we talk about the footprint because as a basis of online communication, they need to know what it means to be online. And that is starting from digital footprint. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, based on the digital footprint, what kind of uh, um, privacy they need to protect uh, as a human right. So we are looking at all these eight components uh, for uh, digital citizenship skill. It's also for me interesting the the approach that you're taking to um, improving digit the the way people become digitized. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you're not kind of going back to companies and saying that um, um, <clears throat> you, you need to design better, or you're not saying to people that you should just you know log off and turn off everything and throw away your devices. Um, is this the best way, do you think, like empowering people with the right skills or does it take, um, you know, um, lots of different approaches from industry itself in addition to education and empowerment? Mm. Uh, this is a really good question uh, because as a, as a society as a whole, I believe it has to be collective responsibility. This is what we do as a DK Average Health is, is, First of all, we want our children to be independent thinker. So that's why we teach them about this all a topic for them to be smart online and wise online. Uh, given the situation that digital world is not necessarily a uh, best place for them, <laughs> but mm -hmm. but uh, that doesn't mean that you know the ICT companies and government can um, just lay back. Uh, I think, you know, uh, we look at the five different stakeholders. So one, and set aside from the children, the parents have to do the, uh, do the right job. The parents are the first gateway, um, gatekeeper for the online protection. Um, second, we look at the schools, teachers, you know, you know, whether school have a right policy, whether school have a right practice, whether the school empower teachers to conduct this digital citizenship uh, training. This is also a uh, very important. The third is about the, um, the ICT company, you know, whether they have the ethical principle, whether their, um, the child's rights, uh, in their, um, in their uh, design product and service product, and also whether they react to the online uh, protection. Um, this is a really critical issue. 
And mm -hmm. the lastly, um, the government should have uh, also a timely manner to respond to the online risk, but at the same time, they need to have the right policy to be uh, placed in their um, um, in, 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 in protecting uh, children at the same time to promote the digital citizenship. So now, uh, you know, nations are competing each other to uh, their nation into the smart nation, smart city. So technology and digital transformation is a key national agenda. And a lot of time, as we have seen in Korea in the past 10 years, uh, we put too much emphasis in growth, and then there is lack of check, uh, check and balance for um, industry as well as government. Um, so this is something that we need to pay attention now, and uh, we need to change the tide, I believe. Fantastic. Um, and I think that's that's a really nice kind of point to talk about now, because one of my, my next question, in addition to education institutions and schools, etc. Um, you've also done some amazing partnership work with other institutions. So I'm really one I'm really interested to know why do you think digital intelligence is so important now to organizations like the World Economic Forum, Twitter and Google? Sure. Um, the World Economic Forum is the, the actually frontiers in thinking about the future society in term, um, in fourth industrial revolution. So they're the one who coined the terms of fourth industrial revolution. And uh, Professor Klaus Schwab um, emphasized that, you know, this is fourth industrial revolution. So unlike anything mankind has previously experienced. Hmm. So what he said is that, uh, while this new technology merging together and they're creating the new world, uh, they can bring the mankind either huge promise or potential peril. So we are in the crossroad between um, whether we can bring our technology to support the human <laughs> to uh, have a better future or it can also bring us into the peril. So we talk about AI, you know, Ellen, Ellen Musk and uh, Martin Zuckerberg um, uh, argument show that there's a very too distinctive um, understanding of our technology and the future. But one thing for sure, that, you know, we want to ensure that we want to create the ethical future, which ensure that every child can have the opportunity to thrive in this digital future. In order to do that, you know, we really need to pay attention to the dangers that children are currently in and what are the actually new education paradigm that we have to provide to the children to make sure that the education becomes a driver to bring us not to peril, but to promise. Mm -hmm. So along that line, this is a hot topic. I guess it is not just a World Economic Forum. I mean, and now, you know, every nation is, is uh, working together to find a solution. Um, not alone the technology company. Would you say then, um, would you say that digital mm -hmm. intelligence only applies to children? Or, you know, do you think that it has actual relevance to the billions of people that already use digital tools and are impacted by them? Um, I, I believe I need more DQ as well. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> As an individual, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, we all um, living in the very particular time in the beginning of the industrial revolution, we see that the dramatic change last five years, how technology has shifted our, our interaction and societal system. So um, it is not just for the children. The reason we focus on children is they're our future and, you know, it impacts our children most dramatic way. If you see our children are in front of computer all the time, they're born with uh, basically iPads sometimes, right? Mm. <laughs> so, um, so I think it is our uh, duty for us to take care of our children first, but definitely uh, this is an issue for every actually generation who are living in the, today's world. So I'm, I'm really interested to know if you can share any, any examples of the way that um, the being digitally intelligent or the way any of your work that has actually impacted people's lives? 
Yeah, uh, we are working with the young children and and teachers, which is very exciting. Actually, much more fun than I go and talk with the ministers and business CEO <laughs> in World Economic <laughs> Forum for sure. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, it, uh, the the best actually delight that I have uh, working in DQ actually, which gave me a, a enormous <clears throat> energy is when I hear the children to say, oh, I didn't really realize the, the how the technology has been in, impacted me. So um, this is an example from South Korea. Uh, she is a number one student in the class and a teacher never thought that she has uh, any issue. She is one of the brightest one. And she was in fact, um, had a porn addict. She, she started to have this porn uh, issue, um, and it, actually, she was she was using her her father's ID. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, while he's using her father's <laughs> computer, she started to get access to this porn site, and then now she she got a huge collection of uh, porn. And uh, actually, nobody noticed about this issue, um, and she. Um, she sh she shared with her teachers in that she didn't know how it actually impacted her um, in an emotional way and her identity. Uh -huh. And she had a um, the depression issue, um, uh -huh. and nobody actually noticed because she is so bright. And you know, a lot of times in Korea, the school scores is is hiding a lot of other aspects of yeah. children, uh, which is also true in any other part of the world. Um, so she started to understand the, the nature of the problem. She started to talk with people. So awareness is, is, is the first step that we want to bring um, attention. And uh, there's a tons of um, example that we actually mm, encounter in almost every class is when I talk with teachers. Um, and there, there's a, you know, we also providing a cyberbullying intervention. So our online platform have a very unique ability to detect children at, at cyber risk. So um, in our uh, data, um, among the children who received the cyberbullying, uh, about 60% of children say they wanted to get a extra help and 50% of them say they didn't get any really tangible help. So that is a huge number of children. If you think about eight to 12 years old, uh, having the problem themselves. Um, and as well, actually they couldn't seek the help they needed. So what we did in Singapore and actually uh, we started out in Australia as well to connect them with the counseling. So when we detect the children at risk, uh, we prompt them and say, do you, do you want to talk to someone who is, who can professionally help you? Um, so we conducted a research, um, a few years ago and we just published the result and we found that this has really helped children who are at risk and uh, we it is a vehicle for us to proactively intervene children uh, who are at risk so this is um uh we try to do is is not just reactive response on the cyber risk but also, also proactive measure that we want to put uh, on protection I'm really interested to know, um, like we've been talking about everything, all of the work, all the fantastic work that you're doing and the partnerships that you're making. But I'm really interested to know, what do you think a digitally intelligent person um, either looks like or how does a digitally intelligent person act online or when they're digitized? Um, very good question. I always uh, use the analogy of master versus slave. Mm. Um, a lot of time we think we make a choice, but we are targeted by the personalized service, <laughs> and and we make a choice uh, among the choices that was given by the social media, <laughs> yeah. right? So um, there's a wonderful article that was um, 
talked about you know freedom and hijack mind and actually that's what has been uh, done on the social media it has been architectured um, but I'm, I'm not saying that we are not master of our faith but you know a lot of times when we actually children in we call the involution in a various cyber risk and also a lot of structure issue of fake news and malinformation and so on uh, we the the worst actually possible outcome is uh, I would say the humanness, loss of humanness, lot, which means a uh, lots of uh, ability to think. We are so uh, used to uh, instant gratification. Uh, we are losing our patience to wait. Um, we are not tolerant enough. We get the news that are only provided that we'd like to read. Uh, so. More and more children are exposed to a lot of information. You know, the worst outcome is that they get the bias worldview. They uh, they're losing the ability to think. So, what we want to promote um, is through the DQ is actually uh, I call the golden rule. As a we as a community, mm -hmm. community value and critical thinking to promote the common good. So uh, we want to say uh, ideal, uh, the master uh, with the DQ of technology is so who can utilize technology for common goods, uh, to establish common goods, create the technology for common goods, use a uh, use of technology for the common goods, and et cetera, et cetera. So who, who, who just not per, um, reactively receive it, but proactively tackle the challenges and um, finding a solution to solve the issues um, to bring the better future. I, I, I'm not so sure if I'm actually answering in a right way or not. No, but, no, it's perfect. Yeah. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've come to the end of the interview, unfortunately. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work and connect with you? DQinstitute.org. Uh, if you come to this website, uh, you can find uh, everything that we just discussed. And please contact me um, at any time. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Dr. Park, it's been a complete pleasure having you on the show. And thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Thank you.